the spoiler alert is going up because I it is time to talk about Star Trek Picard. Episode 9 of Season 3, the penultimate episode of the season. You know, I, I was enjoying this season, and I was with it. I was into it. And then something happens at the end of this last episode that it was like out of left field. It was a bolt from the blue. Beyond being an apology, beyond being a love letter to Star Trek lore and fandom, this was a gift. This is something you could only have done if you had not just love for Star Trek, not just love for your craft as a writer, but truly love for the fans. And uh, that's the only way I can describe it. Captain's Log, previously on the Captain's Cast live stream, live every Thursday and Sunday with me, Captain Garrett. Shall we talk about Star Trek Picard? Spoiler alert, the spoiler alert is going up. Let me explain how I felt about episode eight. Every episode's gotten better and better and better. And I think what happened was, because every episode was getting better and better and better, and every episode I was like, oh, I can't wait for the next one. I get to episode eight. It was like, it kind of was just as good as everything that had come before. And I think it was the first episode where I didn't feel like, wow, this just took it to another level. It, the return of data in episode eight is pretty powerful. Now, for a character that has died twice, <laughs> this is a difficult proposition of my friends. Uh, Terry Batalis has some chops, let me tell you. It is no easy task to bring back a character that has died twice and have it not seem ridiculous. Uh, it's That's not an easy needle to thread, and it only shows how determined this. This guy must be the most stubborn Star Trek fan slash writer of all time. I'm not kidding you. This guy is on a mission. There ain't no doubt about it. He got a hold of this series, and he was like, I am on a freaking mission. Everything that was done wrong will be put right. Everything. Here comes Terry Metallus. And he's like, screw it. I'm bringing it back because that I that ain't happening. Not on my watch. <laughs> so there was Jack Crusher's continuing plot about these weird visions. And he's having all these voices. To my delight, the episode nine begins with literally we walk through the door and we find out exactly what it is. And so Picard has future Alzheimer's, a.k.a. Eromotic syndrome, which is a genetic congenital defect. Well, what we discover in this episode is they were wrong. He did not have a, a genetic defect. What he had was an organic implant that the Borg had placed into his genetic code as part of his assimilation as Locutus of Borg. Basically, the Borg's genetic code went straight into Jack. And now Jack essentially is the, he has the fully formed genetic Borg implant in his head. And so the reason he's able to take control of the minds of other people is because of this Borg implant. And you might say, but Captain, Captain, that sounds a lot like a Kurtzman plot. Oh, gee, oh, the Borg can just organically control people. Oh, that wasn't in any of the Voyager episodes, and you would be right. And Mr. Vitalis has thought of that as well, because it turns out that what has happened is that the changelings who were in alliance with the Borg, they were implanting in the Starfleet transporter system a code that would basically add a genetic code to anyone who used the transporter system. Only people that have been using the transporter system for the last few years and are of a certain age to be able to accept the DNA are affected. Only people of, of like age 25 and below in Starfleet can be affected by this. And so you wind up with all the older people in the fleet are fighting all the younger people who have now become Borg drones. The Borg mind virus took over all the kids. It pays off every single plot setup. The fleet is filled with sleeper Borg drones so that now all the ships act like a hive mind. There's a couple dialogues that are like, oh boy, we are really paring that word count down to the minimum so we can just get those expositions in. And look, they certainly did it better than Moff Gideon in uh, Mandalorian. I'll give him that. But yes, it was getting a bit leaden. And so I will allow it. The captain will allow it. All the young characters are now Borg drones and incapacitated. The entire Starfleet is now networked in a hive mind computer network, right? Which means that no ship is safe. Which means our only option, we'd have to go to the Starfleet Museum. Are they going to get a Constitution class? Are they going to get on an old Kirk Enterprise, which that would be super cool? Are they going to get on the NX class? They have to fly an NX class ship. That would be fun. Oh man, to see like Archer's old ship. And then the space dock 
doors open and Jordy explains, I've been restoring the Enterprise D. And the doors open on the Enterprise D fully restored. He he even explains the Prime Directive would not allow them to leave the saucer section on Viridian 3 following the events of Star Trek Generation. So they recovered it. And he spent all these years lovingly restoring it to working order. So it's the original Enterprise D saucer section. And he cannibalized the drive section from another ship of that was also Galaxy Class. And there's a couple of great lines where, you know, oh, there's a great line where they're they're flying towards it and Jordy's explaining how he's restored it. He's like, well, obviously we can't use the Enterprise E. And then they all kind of just look at Worf and Worf is like, that was not my fault. One of the things that I hated about seasons one and two of Star Trek Picard is that it it is the most incredible destruction. Like if you think that Luke Skywalker got Jake Skywalkered, what they did to Picard in season one, imagine a whole season. Imagine two seasons of Jake Skywalker. Like, hear me when I say this. It was not possible for this show to be good, in my opinion, because that would require Patrick Stewart to be good. And that was not possible. It was not possible. He's not the same man. That's what I thought. Here we are on the bridge of the Enterprise D, and Picard is walking around and he says, do you know what I missed? I missed the carpet. And they all have a good laugh about it. And it's just a wonderful nod to the fans. And, you know, it's it's just this side of meta. And I can kind of... Captain will allow it. I will allow it. This is the ship where their lives were at their absolute peak. And they say, Captain, should we get underway? And Data sits in his spot. Jordy sits where he used to sit when he was the pilot in season one. Worf is at the tactical everybody's where they belong. It's so wonderful. And they say to Picard, hey, should we, is it time to get going? And Picard says, oh, yes, take your stations, please. It's with this smooth command. It's like like it's effortless. It's just, this is what he's always done. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's a man in total command. He sits down in the captain chair, and you know what he does? He does the Picard maneuver. <laughs> Do you want to see the Picard maneuver? This is the Picard maneuver. He sits down in the captain's chair, straightens. That's the Picard maneuver. Your dear captain does the Picard. I don't have to with this shirt because this isn't really, you know. But when I'm wearing like a button down, Picard maneuver. Every man should use the Picard maneuver. Liberally. Liberally. You should use it before any meeting. You should use it before an interview. You should use it before meeting with your boss or asking for a promotion. Uh, you should use it on your wedding day. Picard maneuver. He gives a couple of orders along the lines of take us out, you know, plot a course, etc. And then he says, make it so. And it's and then they just allow that moment to just breathe. And then you see the Enterprise D sail out of space dock in all her glory. I was speechless. I had th no part of me was expecting this. I, there was no spoiler I saw on the internet. There was nothing. I, I had no expectation of seeing the Enterprise D in this series. None. Absolutely none. And I was happy. I was happy with the Titan. The Titan is cool. I enjoy the Titan. I got to see the Voyager. I got to see the Defiant. And, uh, you know, even the, even the old bounty bird of prey from Star Trek IV, the Voyage Home. You know, I was happy. I, that was enough for me. I, I didn't need more than that. I just didn't. This... This was a gift beyond price. As a Star Trek fan, and worse, a, a traumatized and abused Star Trek fan who had given up, who had laid Star Trek to rest, this was a gift beyond price. First couple episodes, the first one through four episodes of season three to me were an apology. They were a beautiful, heartfelt, truly wonderful apology to the fans for the misery that had been inflicted, not just on Picard, but on the legacy of Kirk with Star Trek Discovery, on the legacy of the Federation and Starfleet with, uh, you know, the dystopia in the same. But then the next few episodes became a kind of love letter to Picard and to the characters and, and to the concept of Star Trek itself. They have woven meaningful, not just member berries, but meaningful elements of, date, of Deep Space Nine, Voyager, 
Enterprise, the original series, they have woven elements of every single one throughout this show in a kind of tapestry. And I was good with that. I didn't need anything more. I was happy. I was like, thank you. I appreciate it. And then this episode with this moment with the Enterprise D, it was a gift beyond all price. You, you could not have made something so beautiful if you didn't really mean to. Because listen, every plot element in this season was laying the foundation of this moment, every single thing. And it was like, this is what he wanted. It took enormous discipline as a writer to make sure that this moment could land properly, to have our characters, our, our old veteran legacy characters in the unique position of being the only people in all of Starfleet that can save the day. And not only that, that literally it can't be a young person. It can't be a newcomer. It can only be them. How brilliant is that? I just feel that Metallus wanted to give the fans something they could always have. No matter what happens after this point, this is something you will always have to look back on. I think that we fans, if we could find a way to, to give Terry Metallus some kind of gift on our behalf, it would just be, and to, by extension, anyone that helped him in creating this show, I just, I just would love to do that. I have no idea how that could be achieved, and I'm thinking about it. Because no, Hollywood, right, is never going to give Terry Metalis an award. He's never going to win an, uh, an Emmy. He's never going to get anything for this. In fact, he, what he's likely to get is a knife in the back from Akiva Goldsman and Kurtzman. That's what he's likely to get. He's likely to get absolutely no appreciation or thanks whatsoever from his industry for what he's done here. But what if we as fans could give him something back. I, I have no idea what that would look like, but so, maybe something as simple as a letter, you know, signed by as many fans as could sign it. The mission will continue on the Captain's Cast live stream with me, Captain Garrett, on the Swords and Starships channel live every Thursday and Sunday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it, and I will see you in the chat out there. Make sure to give me a follow on Locals at swordsandstarships.locals.com. It's free to follow and direct message me on Locals, and this will help defend against YouTube censorship and allow me to maintain a direct connection with you. The mission of this channel is to build a fellowship of sci-fi, fantasy, and action-adventure fans who prize freedom of speech and artistic expression above all. And if you choose to support the channel with a paid membership, there will be even more exclusive content in store, and I would certainly be honored to earn your support. Until then, hail to you, hail to the Fellowship, and hail to the Iron Age of Entertainment.